Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Emilio Cavenstrinati. I'm the Future Wireless System Scientific and Innovation Program Director at CELIT, the RICG Project Coordinator, which actually is focused on reconfigurable intelligence phases for CG networks, funded by the EU Commission, the CG Goals and the CG DISAC Project Coordinator, which have been freshly accepted starting in 2024, January 2024, and focus on CG goals on semantic and goal-oriented communications, and CG DISAC on CG integrated communication and sensing communication. And I'm also the new CG program director. So first of all, thank you for inviting me here at the Mobile Korea 2023. Sorry for not making it in person, had very some uh, Issues to come, last minute. The title of my presentation is The Post-Shannon Era Towards Semantic, Goal-Oriented and Reconfigurable Intelligence Environment Aided CG Communications. If you have any questions at the end of my presentation, you can contact me on my email, which actually is here at the bottom of the slide. In 1926, the visual Nikola Tesla stated, when a wireless is perfectly applied, the whole Earth will be converted into a huge brain. By 2030, responding to the fundamental human and societal needs and based on the expected progress in ICT technology, such processes may become a reality. We'll see new type of services that will drive the 5G beyond evolution, such as the 5Sense interactive hologram technology, interactive optic communications, and in general, any type of service will actually will give new requirements in terms of the network. For example, as low latency, we will see low latency constraint of the order, not only the micro milliseconds, but also the microseconds. The thing that now communication will not be the only concern about the communication system, computation and communication will not be the only two one, but will be the new topic, a new joint problem of communication, computation, caching, and control together. And then those networks will need to be very fast and deliver very ultra high capacity, going to tens of terabit per seconds. And we also have native connect compute design of the system. So we'll see an evolution in terms of services, as for instance, we'll not have anymore only the massive type communications, but we're going to have massive machine type communication supporting distributed intelligence for CG services. So that's actually somehow is the evolution and in the progression what we already have in 5G, what actually is different here that we have an ubiquitous presence of the support of machine learning, AI, and actually the network itself is structured to capture data and at the same time process and filter this data. You have more details on this paper we cite here. Then you will also have the global enhanced mobile broadband services, where the major difference is that we will scale up not only on the 2D space, but we'll cover the 3D space, having service, for example, for flying drones, uh, orbit uh, stations where potential uh, fabrication of materials, and so on. So we'll give not only the, the, the connectivity and in general, the broadband service to the 2D space, but overall on the air in the 3D space. Then we also have the announcement of the URLC um, service that we already have in 5G, where the ultra reliable low latency computation, communication, and control services were actually the major change here is that. The concern about reliability we already have in 5G, which mainly focus on the connectivity reliability, here we'll have a shift. Because at the end, what you want to have is an act of control, an act of decision, for which the real reliability where we will focus on is what we call the inference of decision reliability. So it's not only, only about how precisely bits are received by the receiver, but how useful and pertinent are those bits received and with enough quality, with not too much errors, not too much noise, in order to achieve the right decision. 
Then there's a new family of services, what we call the semantic services, which actually are concerned in any type of service where we need a support of uh, intelligence. So we need to, uh, so we have intelligent agent uh, inter between together, working together, can be natural or artificial. And what they do actually, they do not share bits, they share knowledge. And by sharing knowledge, there's something that can be interpreted and actually that's all difference on the services for which we do not transmit all the data. What we do induce and train reasoning for uh, enhancing skills of the receiver, uh, enable decision, enable understanding, or just improving the level of knowledge he has. And actually, it's really a uh, performance in several contexts, like, for example, the metaverse, well, also what we call the sensational services, where actually we have this also this dimension of the sense get immersive, the digital twins, and uh, I would say in general, any bi-directional collaboration between cyber physical spaces or cyber physical spaces and uh, real spaces. So what actually, it's one of the issues we are trying to address, or we want to address here, is that there is, a, as we said, exponential growth, uh, in terms of uh, amount of data that's flowing to the network, they actually consume a lot of energy also. If you see the statistics and the prediction, we see that actually we're going in a direction where we're going to have 9 billions of connected people on the earth. We'll have trillions of connected devices and where the wireless communication and the ISIS will be a commodity using everywhere and anytime. Where actually the cyber and the physical space fusion will turn humans things that even into information so all, all this will is causing this explosion of traffic with a consequent of very unsustainable operation and deployment of the network so one solution might be actually go to what we call the degrowth so stop using technology but that for our point of view is completely unsustainable so the real question is how to find a sustainable growth of technology if we see how the network is operated and how it's consuming, if you, we, we have here in the graph the measured value in terms of what we have in 2G, 3G, 4G, and uh, initial measurement on 5G. And we see actually how the energy efficiency of the system that we can measure, for example, here on kilowatt hour per gigabyte uh, of received information, actually has been improved quite a lot from 2G to 5G. Now let's consider you freeze your, your capacity of, uh, of uh, I mean, the, your, your level of energy efficiency in the system to what we have in 2020 with the starting to 5G. Then if we measure how many square meters or square kilometers of photovoltaic panels of the last generation you will need to uh, feed all the energy that actually is required to, to, to manage all the traffic we have in, in the 5G networks, Actually, it will require in 2020 to cover the entire surface of Mexico with the photovoltaic panels. Then if you consider you stop working on energy efficiency and you keep that level you have in 2020, but you consider that there's this growth of actually uh, traffic uh, demand because actually we're using more and more network, then in 2025 we'll need the entire surface of Australia 2030, all North America. 2035, you will need Asia, Africa, and, Ant uh, and Antarctica. Uh, and then in 2024, you will need to cover twice the surface of Earth and probably will be either not enough. So this actually is something that is not acceptable. The good news is that we have not stopped working on, on energy efficiency in, in the networks. And actually, we foresee to have roughly a factor 100 in terms of improvement of performance in the energy efficiency for which at the end we'll, we'll need to cover only, and I see only in a very ironic way, the surface of France entirely with photovoltaic panels in order to feed all the energy needed for, for, the, for the data flowing and, and process in, in the 5G, sorry, 6G networks. So why we are going to this direction is because there is a specific way we have been conceiving the networks up to 5G. So if you take what is, has been requested in 5G and what we are targeting for 6G from a system level perspective, actually we are mainly focusing on improving the 5G system KPIs. For example, 
by improving the, the traffic capacity of roughly a factor 1000 by uh, also providing a, a latency that actually is either an improvement of roughly a factor of 10 to improve the communication reliability of several order of magnitude and to improve also other, uh, other parameters. Uh, but, but we also asking to do more in the sense of not only covering the 2D space, but 3D space. For example, we want to have a uniform uh, user experience, not only in 2D space, but in 3D space, would improve actually performance about 10 gigabit per second. And also localization precision will be also required in terms of um, 3D space. But then we see also new type of, uh, two new types of uh, system of KPIs. Actually, those are needed to support the connect compute intertween of intelligent networks to also to extend this connect compute store and control network to non-terrestrial networks and to address the sustainability in general in terms of technology, network operation, task achievement, inference achievement, uh, also in terms of electromagnetic fluid radiation limitation. Then we see that actually we start having new types of, of, um, of KPIs, like for example, the energy per bit, actually, the, but also the energy per goal is now rising up because actually it's not only important how many, how efficient you are bit by bit by, by communicating, but also how many bits you need for that specific goal, which is a good strategy to achieve that. And also the reliability is not anymore only a problem of communication, but also a problem in terms of inference. And we also start having electromagnetic field radiation uh, concern. That actually it depends on the area, the specific service, uh, the specific country, and so on. So all of these energy per goal, inference reliability, electromagnetic field radiation are specific of where we are operating and have to be defined specifically. Uh, so then we have indeed this um, technology expectation shift that actually is pushing to have this factor 10, 100, 1000 in terms of improvement of performance that is mainly to have continual continuity with the, with the with standardization we have before, but also to somehow trigger new investment in, of, of industry. But then there's a new type of, a new type of system of KPIs because there are some new type of activities and services that cannot be actually served with the approach we have before. But the real question is, how can we achieve them? This is not just a software update. We need to do something more. And then actually, if you go to the fundamentals, this is the only question I will show actually here in this presentation. So don't be scared. Uh, this actually is a basic um, a channel, a channel, channel information capacity for a single link with a, with a, with a very idle uh, Gaussian channel and so on. But you see what you see here that to improve the capacity, you actually can either improve the bandwidth or you can improve the number of uncorrelated path, like for example, the number of antennas, and you can improve actually the signal to noise plus interference ratio. That means you can either improve the transmission power or be more precise, improve the received power by receiver by pumping up the power, by improving the, the, the antenna gain, being more directive, more, well, I mean, in general, more DBIs in terms of antenna gain and also reducing the level of interference. So how to achieve a factor 1000 in the in improvement in SIGG? Actually, from our perspective, there are three fundamental pillars. First of all, is exploring new spectrum and exploring new way of managing the spectrum. So going to the subterrestrial communication uh, space. Second point is to treat data information in a different way so changing the paradigm from what we have been doing for so far and using and leverage on edge ai and going to the new paradigm of semantic uh, and goal-oriented communication and the third point is the use of new materials and massive intelligent uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces in order to achieve uh, much higher antenna gains but at the same time also being able to control the propagation environment that up to now, now have been considered as fixed by nature. Now, by deploying different relays here and there, we actually modify in a specific way how the propagation is, and we create a much more favorable uh, environment for communication. And all of this actually, technology which are strongly based on the support 
of machine learning in NHI. And actually the question is why, if we are transporting data for AI and machine learning, and if we're using machine learning and AI for improving the performance of the network, why we should not shape the communication in a way which is useful for the AI, not just for human beings. So for going to the classical propagation uh, approach, then actually the, the, we want to improve the, 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 the spectrum. We go want to go for higher spectrum. Why we want to go for higher spectrum? Because with, if you have a chiral frequency, let's say 100 gigahertz, then actually what in products you can do with the hardware you can conceive, you use 10 to 20% of, 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 of this bandwidth. So if you go 100 gigahertz, you can use, let's say, uh, 2 gigahertz, uh, sorry, 20 gigahertz. If you go to 300, you could go 60 and so on and so on. So the why oh, there's this push? The price, the price to pay is actually we have a much, much more important uh, attenuation cost that actually in general rise up with, 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 with the frequency for which at the end you need more transmission power and or you need to shorten the, the, the communication range and or you need a much more impressive antennas which actually enable to increase the antenna gain to compensate this attenuation. Those are actual examples we have in CIA LT, where actually we have prototypes of different frequencies of different antennas, actually, that are, have been also uh, in the, uh, some of the uh, previous generation tested during the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang uh, with, uh, in conjunction with ATRI in, in a previous project we worked together. And uh, those actually are uh, a piece, important piece of the race to the 6G uh, system. But now, if you go to the harder perspective, and you see what does it mean actually asking that much to, to, to the system. Actually, what you realize is that uh, pushing the system to have all this factor of 10, 100, 1000 required to have new uh, performance in terms of hard, in terms of high output power, selectability, isolation, uh, high F max, uh, new materials, new IC technology, also compensation to hardware loss, and so on. So. What I mean, actually, is even if, from a system level point of view, we have a vision about where we want to go, the hardware might limit a lot what we can do. And also the time scale of up, uh, uh, um, updating a deployment, updating the software, is not the same time scale. I find new technology, new material, new process in order to conceive new kind of solutions, water techniques that can actually uh, deliver what is asked by the system level. For example, when we look at what will happen in, in millimeter waves, uh, we saw that at the end, by going to this frequency, the losses between the power amplifier and the antenna was a lot. We actually have losses of maybe a factor of 100, even more, which at the end we have been working on new solutions like integrating on the solution directly antennas in order to limit as much as possible these losses. And if you see what we have as technology today for producing amplifiers of this kind of frequencies, what we see that actually um, the power amplifiers, actually we see that uh, there are some technology that fits for a given output power, but do not fit with a high upper power. And actually, if you look, what, if you go up in the frequency, what we see that between 200 gigahertz and 250 gigahertz, so that's what we call the death valley of technology, because actually as today, they're not commercial stable technology we can conceive in order to produce power amplifier for those kind of transmission. So it means that we already we see at the moment that going up higher than 140, 180 gigahertz is very complicated. And in, in a large scale of use and industrialization, as today is a very hot topic of research, but it's not an industrial reality. So how we achieve this factor of 1000, we already asked 5G in 5G was actually by improving by a factor of 10, the bandwidth, by the factor of 10, the number on tennis and uncorrelated pass. And by factor 10, I would say that the, the spectral efficiency of the system mainly with beam forming and with very high DBI antenna gains, with new modulation coding schemes, with new waveforms, and also try and full duplex solutions. Now, what we are saying that we need some paradigm shift going to 6G, and we actually, we are exploring that. There's some material in the research and first paradigm shift is that uh, we want transmission effective outcome. So we go want to go from spectral efficiency of data uh, rental communication. So where before we send more data 
over available spectrum uh, uh, and actually using, for example, techniques like Massimo, uh, now we are seeing for, uh, cell-free beam forming and so on. We want to go from this approach to the approach where we have an effectiveness per goal of transmission strategy. So it's not only a problem of sending all the beat with very high special efficiency, with very low noise, with very low ambiguity. We want to identify the relevant and needed information to recover the meaning intended by the transmitter and to attain a goal at the, at the receiver. So this goes beyond the Shannon paradigm because we go beyond the statistics. We go beyond having an average performance uh, of something, but actually it's important to say that if you isolate a logic in the communication for which you want to achieve exact that in a deterministic way, then actually there are some of those bits, some of this information that is critical, the other you can either have degraded or completely lost. So we focus rather on the actual effort that the receive information has on the performance uh, of an action of the receiver. Then there's another important paradigm shift, paradigm shift number two, that actually is on shaping the communication environment. So we have been working all the time on fighting the un uncontrollable dictated by nature propagation environment. How? With high antenna gains, uh, with modulation transmission power, with a, a large diversity schemes in terms of space, time, frequency, polarization, multipaths, multi-user code, and so on. Now that he has that, and actually there's a kind of material in the community to create and shape on demand radio, uh, the smart radio environment. And actually can be done, for example, by the use of recomfortable intelligence phases, where actually we control different react, uh, reflector and, and actually we actually, we change the scattering pro uh, properties of the propagation environment. And this actually is what we do in this RISEG project that I'm coordinating, where actually we isolate what we call the boost area uh, in, in a space, in a space where actually we decide to boost specifically the high connectivity by having, for example, a boost in terms of the, of the link capacity and or the localization precision and or the, the secrecy of the communication and or the energy efficiency of the communication, or we want to lower down the electromagnetic field radiation. So this action by orchestrating several reconfigurable intelligence phase in a specific space for a set of users. Then there's a third paradigm, the one from a point of view is the most destructive one, is actually communicating only what cannot be deduced or predicted by an AI. If you consider that you have a reasoning machine, an artificial intelligence, or even a human being actually, being able to correct something with the receiver, you don't need to send everything. You need to just to send what is needed in terms to guess something with a given reliability. So we move from raw data uh, moving uh, to feed the machine learning and AI. Uh, it's all you need. That's the approach we have today. So we just move blinding data and then actually there will be processed by this kind of black box. We don't understand much what to do. Uh, we're actually, we have the paradox, the data paradox that the AE need data, but the data needs AI. Because actually, AE need data in order to train and to get smarter, smarter, smarter. But, uh, but also, data need AI in, in terms to be selective, filter, and also transport, communicate it in an efficient way. So we are in a trend where actually there was explosion of traffic, I'll say before, where actually we have uh, and not stopping level of an appetite of data to be generated, transmitted, um, processed and stored. So what, what we ask now is to again, to communicate only what cannot be deduced or predicted by AI. So actually we go to, no, to uh, stopping to do this blind transmission of a symbol with a very high fidelity where you don't know what you're transmitting. It's like, pressing keys randomly on, on, on a keyboard indeed. And you just want to that all, all, the, all these keys are pr precisely and perfectly uh, shared, but at the end, you don't know what you're doing. Now, if you, if you actually uh, consider the statement that which I like a lot, that there is no sense in being precise when either you don't know what you're talking about, actually, that was John von Neumann. And actually, the question is why we are sending so precisely 
the information, all the information, if there is a reason machine is able to correct and select, it may be not all of this information is, is needed. So here comes the paradigm shift. Here comes the thing that we say, first understand, and then decide how to effectively convey the intended meaning to the receiver. So this actually enables more context aware and meaningful interaction between intelligent agents, where you move beyond the exchange of raw data. What you do, you go for a communication where you share only the knowledge that cannot be reliably deduced or predicted by the receiver, uh, which is an AI agent. So actually, this is a fundamental communication statement of semantic communication, where shall enable to facilitate knowledge sharing, consensus building, and integration of a diverse perspective, dispute reasoning, and collaboration among intelligent agent systems. That actually was not the case uh, at the Shannon time, 70 plus years ago. Why? Because actually AI was not there. Uh, the computing power that we have today is not there. And also there was not this uh, the same need we have today. But today we have this context. And actually uh, it's very important to see what we can do. So if we want to know what is uh, semantic communication, actually I, I try to do the, 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 the trick to us to chat GPT. So what is, uh, what, what is actually semantic communication? Actually, the point that there's not a consensus today in the full definition of that. But actually, what we can say is that semantic communication is a communication with a goal of stimulating reasoning rather than ensuring the bit accuracy of shared raw data at the receiver side. So semantic communication means that what you share is a meaning Meaning means that you share information that means something to the receiver. And this actually has to be understood. Either if uh, I, if I make an error, but it can be correct by the receiver, that is a compression opportunity. If I, I share some knowledge, that's an opportunity to increase the capability of understanding of the receiver because you're training while communicating. It actually was already there uh, 70 plus years ago. It was already Shannon Weather in, in 14, uh, 1949 stated that actually there are two levels of communication, the technical problem, the one, the one we are dealing with today, the semantic problem, where actually it's how precisely do the semantic symbol convey the desired meaning, and the level C, the, uh, the third level, where that is the effective meaning that, okay, you receive something precisely, I understand what you receive, but is it useful to achieve an action, to decide something, do a control? So at that time, given the mathematics they have, the problem they have, they left out the level B, level C, the focus on the engineering problem, the way we have today. But now it's time to go for, for a different way. So actually what I'm saying here that we have been focusing all the time here uh, mainly on, on this challenging, important part of, of dealing with the physical channel, doing the network engineering, coding, encoding, uh, and so on. But now there's time also to include embed the intelligence into the system. And then where are the gains here? We have gains in terms of data compression and our first experimental tests show that we can have even a factor of 1000 easily, depending on the specific context you have. You introduce also robustness because, because you have this reasoning capacity, then you're able to uh, correct errors. Uh, for example, if I tell you higher, but you're speaking about a, a fire station, you might understand this fire, what I'm saying. So this H and F at the beginning of the word is, uh, is an error, you can correct. At the same time, means you can also push less the system and accept some errors because you can correct. Then you also induce AI reasoning for which you are training the AI while communicating. And you can also reduce a lot the, uh, the energy cost because you are, you are extracting this data, you are, you are filtering this data, you are, you, are, you are sending this data, and you are storing this data. And you will use much less resource in communication, We again, you are transmitting much less data here. So, um, so that, that, that actually, that, that's the real that what we can have, and at the end, what we want to do is like a old couple been living all their life together, at the first meeting, we discuss each other, they, they introduce themselves, they scandly with all the protocols and the control, uh, something, describe a question, then they thanks and acknowledge for, for the achievement of the, what they ask. Then after several months, when you have been communicating for a while, they actually, you know, already each other, 
and actually you exploit the thing, you know each other, you just briefly introduce yourself and what you want to do. And are you briefly describe the, what, you, what you need and you briefly say thanks. Then after seven years, when the communication is really established and you know the context that the two agents are very trained together, there's no introduction. You expect the, uh, the other does the action you, you, you need. You ask with a very short question and you don't thank. And then after a whole life, it's like an old couple living together. Naturally, they're just able to hear each other and ask very quick eye contact. And there's no thanks. Just wait for the next uh, eye contact to for a next communication. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please send me an email. I will be very happy to answer to your questions.